I have always been fascinated by mysterious disappearances, especially those that fall under the umbrella of the missing 411 phenomenon. These cases characterized by strange circumstances and unexplained vanishing have captivated the mind of investigators and sparked countless theories. However, it wasn't until I stumbled upon a personal encounter that my skepticism turned into chilling belief. I loved the outdoors, often exploring remote areas far off the beaten path. On one particular trip, I decided to venture into the deep forest, known for its picturesque landscapes and hidden trails. The day had started like any other adventure, bright sun, a light breeze, and a sense of excitement in the air. I set off along the well-trodden path, taking in the sights and sounds of nature. The dense foliage seemed to form a protective canopy overhead, casting a glow on the forest floor. Birds chirped and small woodland creatures scurried about, creating a harmonious symphony of life. As I made my way deeper into the woods, I noticed a subtle change in the atmosphere. The air grew heavy and an eerie silence had settled around me. It was as if the forest had held its breath sensing an unseen presence that disrupted its natural rhythm. Unfazed by the shift, I pressed on, driven by curiosity and a thirst of adventure. But as time passed, the tranquility of these surroundings had morphed into an unsettling stillness. The once vibrant colors of the flora had faded, and an overwhelming feeling of being watched had engulfed me. Despite my growing unease, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was drawing me deeper into the heart of the forest. Each step that I took seemed to lead me farther away from the known trails and deeper into an uncharted realm. It was as if the forest itself was toying with my senses, luring me into its clutches. The hours slipped away unnoticed and soon the daylight began to wane. Panic set in as I realized that I had lost all sense of direction. The once familiar landmarks had vanished, leaving me disoriented and stranded in an unfamiliar and treacherous environment. As night fell, the forest came alive with an unsettling energy. Whispers carried on the wind, voices that were both familiar and unfamiliar beckoning me to follow. Shadows danced in the moonlight, taking on grotesque forms that sent shivers down my spine. It was as if the forest had become a living entity toying with my sanity. Exhausted and afraid, I sought refuge beneath a towering ancient tree, hoping to find solace in its presence. But as I closed my eyes, the forest grip tightened. Strange visions plagued my dreams. Shadows moving through the underbrush, ethereal figures whispering ancient secrets, and a sense of impending doom. When I awoke, the sun had risen, but the forest had remained an enigma. I stumbled upon a park ranger who had been searching. He had received reports of a lost hiker in the area and had begun a rescue operation. He led me back to safety, his eyes filled with concern and understanding. Though I had emerged physically unscathed, the experience left a mark on my psyche. It was as if the forest had revealed its true nature. A realm where reality and the supernatural intertwine. The missing 411 cases that had once intrigued me now held a deeply personal meaning. I had glimpsed a fraction of the terror and confusion that befell those who vanished without a trace. Since that day, I have carried a newfound respect for the mysteries that lie within the forest depths. I no longer view them as mere stories but as cautionary tales. A reminder that nature is vast and powerful, and that there are forces beyond our comprehension. And so I share my experiences with others, urging them to approach the wilderness with caution and preparedness. When I was in high school, I took a glass blowing course at a remote craft school called a Snow Farm, located on the foothills of the Berkshire Mountains. It was a two-week course and our instructor was this guy in his early to mid-forties who was super tough and ripped, but also very friendly looking. He wore glasses and a tank top to class every day, 
which revealed these thick scars on the back of his neck and shoulder, as well as a fully tattooed back. The most interesting thing about his appearance, however, was this super villain-esque scar running from the top of his forehead down across his right eye and ending at the bottom of his cheek. As the class got more friendly with him, a few fellow classmates and I asked him what his back piece looked like. He took off his shirt and revealed a vibrantly colorful tattoo of a dragon holding a box cutter. When we asked about the significance of the box cutter, he told us an incredible story that I honestly wouldn't have believed, had he not had the scars to prove it. He began by telling us that he was an amateur boxer for many years and was quite familiar with fighting. One day, he was approached by a druggie that started screaming at him and trying to fight. The druggie was apparently trying to rob him. Our instructor at the time had punched him and knocked him unconscious. He explained to us though that when somebody is under the influence of crack or other intense stimulants, they develop almost superhuman abilities. I have heard stories like this since that corroborate this. Well, after knocking him out, he got right back up and kept at it. So he knocked him out a third time. This time, the guy pulled out a box cutter and started slashing at our instructor's face, arms, and back. I'm not sure if the guy first attacked him from behind, maybe as he was walking away, because these scars on the back of his neck made him seem like he was sliced by surprise. He knocked the guy out again, this time grabbing the box cutter and stabbing the guy over and over in the chest with it. He took off his shirt and he tied it around his head to prevent the bleeding. He told us that every time his heart would beat, blood would squirt from his head. He then hopped on his bike and rode 20 minutes to the nearest hospital. This story truly sounds out of a movie, but our instructor later explained to me that privately, he too was smoking and selling the drug at the time. The fight was the result of a deal gone bad. I asked him if he thinks that he killed the guy and he said that he had no idea because he left immediately after. I got to thinking about how deep of a blade one would need to pierce internal organs. Not really sure, but regardless, I thought that it was the most valid story behind a tattoo that I had ever heard. He had been clean for years and has a wife and kids now. Him and his wife are quite successful in the glass blowing and metalworking industry. This was back in 2015 when I was 16. It was during the summer and both my parents were heading out of town to visit some relatives and they wouldn't be home for three days. I was the only child and I was the only one left in the house. My grandma did visit me every single day to make me lunch. But of course, she wouldn't stay during the night. And that's when I went wild. Watching movies, gaming, watching YouTube. Everything that you could picture a 16 year old doing when his parents weren't home. So, the second night I was watching a movie, and I ran out of chips and I paused the movie and went down in the kitchen to grab some more. And then I heard a window break and a door opening. The kitchen was separate to the living room where the door was opened. I grabbed a kitchen knife and slowly peeked my head around. And there he was. A tall man around six foot. He had a baseball cap, some old jacket, probably leather. It was torn on the right sleeve. And my phone was in the room upstairs. From the kitchen door, the stairs were directly to its right, so in my mind, I was thinking that I could sneak past him and lock myself in. He was going through the shelf next to the door. Very loudly, I must say. And so I got to the stairs somehow. And he turned around and realized that I was there. Out of fear, I guess, I screamed and I threw the knife at him. I missed him, but it hit the wall beside his head, sticking the knife in it. This somehow scared him off because he ran out, maybe scared that I would throw more knives at him. I did run back to get another. My adrenaline was pumping at the time. When I saw that he did leave, I ran to my room and I called the police. They came quickly and just took fingerprints and any DNA samples that they could find. The next morning, I called my parents and they came back around noon. I don't know why, but I had kept the knife lodged in the wall next to the door. So, making sense, the first question they asked when they got home was, why was there a knife in the wall? We eventually changed the front door with a more heavy-duty one. They found the guy too and they arrested him the same week. 
Apparently the intruder wanted to call the cops on me for supposed assault. I guess the moral of the story is hide when someone is robbing your house or learn how to act like a maniac. Hey everyone, I'm really writing this out as a way to vent because I'm in a situation where I feel really stuck. Any advice is appreciated, but I'm not sure there's anything that can be said that will actually help. I've tried at just about everything. I'm going to start from the beginning. This is a story about two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking that we had made an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. The intent was to rent it out once I had completed my PhD. The house was only about a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone, and everyone let me know that I would be so happy to be in my new house because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy that you could ever meet. So we met the neighbor and he did seem nice enough. He suggested that we exchange numbers just in case I ever needed anything, and I thought that was a good idea. What's the worst that could happen? A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state, and I was left to my own devices. Literally the day that he left, it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away and let me know that he had left a gift for me on my front porch. In his text, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. I went home and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats and my mailbox. At this point, I wasn't that alarmed. He was just being nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names and I took the opportunity to make sure. He knew that I wasn't interested in anything romantic. He replied back with a rambling text about how all the person ever needs is friends and he would like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me text messages frequently. Everything from inviting me fishing to telling me that he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply or just tell him that I was busy. I didn't want to be rude. But I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than neighbors. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know of that if my neighbor knocked on my door, I shouldn't answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet and told the bartender that he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He threatened to kill someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. They called the police and the police took the hatchet from him, but they made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was on meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more, but things got even weirder. One day, I went out to my car to find a dead squirrel in my driveway. The squirrel had been very clearly run over and moved to right in front of the driver's side door. I just stepped over it, got in my car and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly after, I received a text from my neighbor that said, Someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway. Don't worry, I moved it for you. I felt like this was a weird way to word this, and I had suspected he was the one who had put the squirrel in the driveway in the first place. Another time, I walked out of my house to see that he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in his front yard. He came out and told me that it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my best to avoid him. He would text me, inviting me over, and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I wanted to remain cordial since he was my neighbor but it was getting very annoying and I was uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me that he was watching me come and go from my house. Around Halloween, he handcrafted a large casket and wrote, Here lies the last son of a gun who played mind games, November 2012. What the heck? All this time still sending me messages. Eventually I got fed up and stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I had stopped responding, 
he threw a 50-pound flower pot at my front door. You know, those big concrete planters. Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no-contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it twice, and I filed another report with the police. During this time, I started the process of getting a stalking no-contact order. I saw three different victim advocates who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference, and during that time, someone had attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they didn't succeed, I was aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world, shutting down because of the virus. I was trapped in my home 24-7, with my stalker neighbor right next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me that he was sorry for what he had done, that he could tell when he saw me outside that he made me uncomfortable. And then he went on to tell me that he could tell my hair has gotten longer and that I look beautiful. I went to court and provided all the evidence that I had, the timeline of everything that had ever happened, the text that he had been sending me asking if I wanted a massage, the text that I sent him telling him the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate, the text saying that he knew he made me uncomfortable. I told the judge that I suspected he had attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. And the kicker is, he didn't deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge that he took full accountability for everything. He said that he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose the protection order at all. So in March of 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything was pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he did some weird stuff, but that's because he's a weird dude. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety, though. That is, until he got back up on the drugs again. At this time, we had found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one that he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple of months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspect it was a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. And he moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and as happy in our relationship as we can be. New Year's 2021. I was awoken to yelling. I had turned on my security cameras and got footage of him sticking his head out of his window and screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for about 7 minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities for 7 minutes, it seems like a long time. He called me a harlot and he said, Happy effing New Year. He said that he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police who did respond. They told me that he never said my name so they can't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, There is nothing illegal about yelling in your own house. They left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway is pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure that my cameras were charged, all five of them. Yeah, because of him, I spent over 1k on cameras. Every inch of my yard is covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and my other neighbors talking to people who aren't there. Going outside and screaming nonsense. Things like... I have Cheerios on my necklace. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me up to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day when I heard screaming again. Someone's going to die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house screaming. Are you proud? How about I get my shotgun? I'll get everybody all fired up. I called the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with a violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police told me that it seems like he was off his medication again. And that was that and they left. 
Last night, I was awoken to hammering outside my window at 1am. He was cutting down his privacy fence, horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint and they just told him to stop and that was that. As I write this, he is outside, continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means that the privacy fence only stands about 3 feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my backyard, and now that's gone. All of this is to say that I'm tired. I just want to live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to kill me. Where I can feel confident that he's not going to try to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house to move, but it's difficult. I'm a PhD student and so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work. And because I have four cats, plus my partner's cat and dog, although we have a place secured for them if necessary. And finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult, if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them, so maybe it's partially my fault that I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months but until then, I'm stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm tired, I'm hungry, so I figured that I would write this to vent. If you made it this far, thanks for listening. There are still so many different instances that I've left out. I'm just so exhausted.